We apologize for some sound quality issues in this episode. There were some technical difficulties with one of the mics, and so especially when I'm speaking during the interview, there's variation in volume. Please bear with us. We'll have this corrected in future episodes. Welcome to the Journal of the Southwest Radio. I'm Pat Schwartz, and I'm happy to be back at JSW recording some episodes for you. In recent years, I've been focusing on advocacy work for transportation and mobility justice in Tucson, and in learning from and working with incredible communities in this region, I've been thinking a lot about how we got here, to the southern Arizona we know now. This episode is the first in a short series exploring some of the historical forces that have shaped the urban and peri-urban environments in our desert southwest. To begin, I had a conversation with Dr. Michelle Berry, a historian, an amazing educator, and operating director of the Public History Collaborative at the U of A. Dr. Berry brings a critical feminist perspective to environmental history, with emphasis on queer ecologies and the more than human. In this conversation, we go broad, discussing frameworks, methods, and a general philosophy of doing and recording history. It serves as a kind of intro for some of the other interviews to be released this summer. We're looking forward to sharing it with you. Hi. Hi. (laughs) Did I miss anything in your introduction? I don't think so. Any fun facts? Okay. <laughs> well, there's so many fun facts, but we, we won't start off with that. <laughs> okay, great. Cool. So being a history professor, I'd love to kind of start broad and have a discussion about the practice of history um, as a discipline. So how would you describe your approach to what, what verb would you even use? Doing history, making history, yeah. recording history? It's interesting because my approach has changed over time. So I earned my PhD in like 2000 and five-ish. And I think then I had a very traditional idea of what making history looked like, very archival based, um, very sort of academic for an academic audience, writing rather formally, really utilizing theoretical frameworks, right, to, uh, you know, frame, frame your interpretations, highly analytical practice, etc. Um, and for a somewhat limited audience, mainly other historians, I think as I've taught, I left academia for about a a decade, a little bit more than a decade, and did some work in conservation and then taught high school. Um, And in those intervening years from then until when I came back to the university, I uh, learned that history, making history and writing history and accessing history ideally is for a bigger, broader audience. Um, And so I think now making history has a lot of different manifestations. I think you can make history the way that I traditionally thought about it and was trained as a graduate student. Um, But also we've got uh, opportunities in public history. We've got documentaries. We're increasingly getting, uh, you know, digital history is really interesting. I know you do kind of mapping stuff. I think um, there's all kinds of place-based technological kinds of interventions that can help us make history and offer it to audiences that really transcend, you know, higher education slash the academy. So, um, you know, I think make, I think a lot of people make history in really important, cool ways, and there's not one single way of doing that. I do think it needs to be, uh, you know, based in really good research in, in a wide uh, assortment of set of uh, sources. Um, I think that kind of history makes the story that we tell more complex. And I think the more complex our stories, the more accurate they are. Are there any particular frameworks or thought traditions or even personal experiences like in your own history that inform your your practice? Oh, that's an interesting question. Um, I, you know, I was early on really obsessed with um, all kinds of theoretical frameworks, everything from, you know, Marxism to post-structuralism to all kinds of all that stuff that you get introduced to in graduate school. Um, and I think I, ba- I think I still love that stuff, but I think I increasingly balance it with an understanding or try to at least anyway to understand different lived experiences that sometimes are theoretical thoughts uh, and models uh, that we come up with as academicians and as philosophers, right? That's largely what we are when we get a, when we get a PhD. 
um, are not always what people on the ground are really experiencing. And I think I learned that through the, the research for my book. Um, I was surprised. I went into the archives, you know, in, as a young graduate student thinking, oh, I know what story I'm, I know the story that's going to be in those archives. I just anticipated it. And then I got in the archives and I went, oh man, there's some different stuff going on here that I think I got to pay attention to. And so that, I think combining those two things, understanding that everyday lived uh, experiences in the past um, can be better understood with theoretical grounding and frameworks, but they don't always match uh, really seamlessly and perfectly. Sure. Um, so you mentioned your book, Cow Talk. Could you just tell us a little bit about what that's about? Sure. Uh, Cow Talk looks at the Mountain West region and focuses on range cattle ranchers from 1945, which is right at the end of World War II, to 1965, which is um, kind of right in the middle of some of the the big environmental legislation uh, federally. So especially like the Wilderness Act, and then eventually we get the National Environmental Policy Act in the early 70s, et cetera. So it's sort of these two decades post-war decades where uh, we're starting to see the rise of the formal environmentalist movement, but a lot of the legislation hasn't necessarily taken effect. But cow ranchers are starting to interact a lot with the federal government because of the grazing grazing acts that happened in the 1930s out of the Great Depression, sort of supposedly um, hoping to get a handle on overgrazing and to restore some rangelands and and protect soil, et cetera. Uh, And so it's interesting to me, it was also this moment when beef is really popular and it's a status symbol for consumers to feed to buy beef and feed feed meat at dinner for their families etc so it's this really interesting 20 year period of time for those who raise cattle for those who are in the business of making cows as we might say sure and how like what are the ramifications of that period on how we see the Mountain West today. So, yeah, that's a great question. So that's what drew me to the to the story. I'm a Western Sloper from birth on Western Slope of Colorado um, and kind of grew up around range ranchers and, and uh, agricultural rural peoples. We had a farm and we did some finishing and we had a... Um, some interest in some uh, some cattle ranches on the Western Slope, my family. And so I grew up with those people and with that way of life. And so it was really interesting to me as a kid to just sort of think about uh, that kind of work, the ecology, the rancher's knowledge of both their animals and the, the more than human environments in which they were doing their work with the cows. So that that was formative to me as a young person. But then as I got into graduate school, and even even in the 90s and the 80s and 90s, my mom was very active um, in electoral politics. And so I was surrounded by constant conversations about the Sagebrush Rebellion, about the rise of more conservative kinds of um, politics in, in these range spaces. And it was just fascinating to me to think about how it was that ranchers had so much power in the places, right, on, on the ground, literally, and then so much power electorally. Uh, in the region. And so the more I thought about that, the more I thought, I kind of want to know, we knew a lot about what happened with ranchers in the late 1800s, the cattle baron era. We know quite a bit, or a little bit anyway, about what happens to them in the 20s and 30s and the and the Great Depression and the, in, the you know, sort of the increasing in regulations around grazing. We don't know as much about kind of what, how they form their, their identities and their political power in those post-war years. And I thought that could be really cool. And I didn't know if there'd be any archives, right? You just don't know. And so I started poking around and there were a lot of archives. It was pretty crazy. And so then the story became much bigger than that. Um, I had walked into it thinking it was going to be more formal sort of political uh, study. And it turned out to be almost more of a social and a cultural study about range cattle ranchers and their ecological labor and their um, identities as range ranchers. Um, you mentioned the more than human beings and more than human environments in, in that story and in writing that history. Um, and I know you have a podcast that you are developing. I think I've been seeing more and more within history and other disciplines, um, people producing work that's less anthropocentric and more including the agency and the experience the ways in which it shapes these stories. Do you go into that at all in your book or can you talk a little bit about your podcast or how that's yeah. used in your work now? That's that's exciting because that's that's my favorite stuff right now. Um, for a lot of reasons, I think anthropocentrism isn't very accurate. I think if you really start looking in history, see nature, what we traditionally call nature, right? I, I'm, I, I'm consist- consistently trying to get us to try to think, my students and I, and et cetera, anybody who will listen to me, to think beyond that dualism of human and nature, um, nature culture, that that is the dualism that I think 
is harmful. Um, it doesn't exist in, in all cultures, but it seems very prevalent in our in sort of mainstream Western cultures. So it would be great if we could begin to think beyond it, because I think historically you see the more than human. You see, quote unquote, nature doing a lot of work and doing a, having a lot of, like you're saying, agency, power, effect on history. And that is not to say that human history is environmentally determined. That's an old argument that I I don't subscribe to, but I do think being aware of how how an ant makes us move, right? The power of that, of, of the spider crawling up your arm to sort of literally make you move your arm for whatever reason. I think those kinds of ways of thinking about our connection with the more than human is really powerful and increasingly important because I think in an anthropocentric era, where we think that humans are totally in control, it does all kinds of, I think, almost harmful uh, things to to us. It makes us understand everything we do in sort of this declensionist way, right? That anything that human beings do is a negative, is harmful, is hurtful, that we're not part of nature, so therefore everything that we do is unnatural. And that's kind of that's kind of weird and I think inaccurate. And I think his, history in particular, environmental history, can help us see the ways in which that story is so much more complex. I draw, especially you asked me earlier about kind of the theories and stuff. I am particularly indebted to the Donna Haraways of the world um, and certainly queer ecology and, and, and increasingly animal studies, although I think my thinking on this came before critical animal studies really became a, a, a well-formed field. But all that, all that kind of thinking about um, nature cultures and, and making that into one word, which is Donna Haraway's uh, thinking in the 1980s and 90s, is really uh, what draws me to this, to this thinking. And I think it's uh, useful for us as we move forward trying to think about how to live more sustainably with the more than human rather than against it or, you know, uh, sort of in in opposition to whatever that looks like. Sure. I think that's really fascinating and really important. And it also seems really challenging to try to write those types of histories. Obviously, we don't have an archival retelling of an ant's perspective. So what are the changes in methodologies you've had to make? Yeah, that's a great question. And I don't think I do it in Cow Talk, actually, because Cow Talk is kind of an older, you know, I I did the research many years ago. Um, I wrote so much of it before I kind of came into thinking about this stuff um, in the last few years. So Cow Talk itself, you'll see it like in a couple of the chapters, you'll see this part of my my journey as a scholar come out. And then there'll be these other parts of the book that you're like, that wasn't it at all, right? That's a very hardcore or labor social history, but then there's a couple chapters where you see cattle, you see cattle grubs, um, you see um, microbes of all kinds, cattle diseases, et cetera, you know, playing a huge role in, in forcing ranchers to come together in their collectivity, come together to inform their identity and to advocate for themselves and their cattle in particular ways. And so um, you sort of begin to see the more than in cow talk, but you don't see it maybe as much as I would have loved if I were to rewrite it completely. Um, God forbid. Um, and so uh, I don't know that it, I don't know that in terms of methodology that you have to shift like going into the archives and, but you have to change the questions that you're asking. And as you read the sources, you have to not, you have to kind of pay attention to the ant rather than glossing over it, rather than glossing over it and looking for a conversation about the law or about the meeting of the humans, um, the election of the, you know, the president of the Arizona Cattle Growers Association, et cetera. Like that stuff's important also. But so it's easy for us, I think, as historians and as humanists to overlook the ant. But the ant is there in and not and I think not just in resource based archives, I think uh, in lots of different places. Is that what we can expect from your burgeoning podcast? Yes, the podcast more than um, it's in it's in partnership with Emily Wakefield, who I wrote my first book with. So we're just we always we can't ever seem to not work together, um, <laughs> which I'm very fortunate because she's amazing. Um, and so she is uh, the endowed chair at the Andrus Center for Public Policy, and she and I have hatched this idea to create a podcast. It's a, it's a uh, it's a 12 episode podcast where um, we're trying to build an ecosystem. So each episode will be part of an ecosystem that would be recognizable to someone in the Mountain West. And by Mountain West, we sort of mean that region that's connected by the spine of the Rocky Mountains. So, you know, we'll start with soil, we'll have water, we'll think about uh, a variety of different kinds of plants. We'll go into herbivores, specifically prairie dogs and Emily's obsession, which is the beavers, um, and just sort of build the ecosystem from there, having uh, carnivores, specifically coyotes. 
And then we're kind of going to think about uh, more than human non-organic stuff like roads. Um, so and the importance of that kind of built environment to the region also. So it's going to be really exciting. We've got a great um, producer, Rooks Giotti, who is um, has worked with High Country News, um, which was a, a publication that I loved growing up on the Western Slope. Of course, it's from Western Colorado. <laughs> so we're really excited about about it because what we're going to hope to do is show that history is more than you think it is. Because so many people don't think history has anything to do with the with the more than human, right? With even even environmental history is very. When I say I'm an environmental historian, I get these blank looks on, from people's faces. Um, so we're kind of trying to draw some attention to that particular field. But then we also want to think about uh, how life and and the interactions between humans and more than humans is more than people think it is, um, and that the region itself is maybe more than we consider it to be. And so we'll have not just historians as guests, but also soil scientists and poets and uh, all kinds of, of fun guests on it. So it should be really it should be really great we're in the process now of recording our first episodes and it's it's great it's it's fun for both of us to stretch outside of that traditional formal writing right as you know sure. podcasting podcasting is very different than academic yes. writing yes it is <laughs> yes it is <laughs> yeah well yeah. that's really exciting i'm yeah. looking forward to that thank you um so public history collaborative is another thing that you are involved in tell us about that that is a really a cool initiative in the department of history that seeks to bring uh, the public to history in new and exciting ways. And we kind of have three areas of focus. One is digital humanities, which we have actually not done as much with just yet, the podcast. It's my project, but it's kind of connected. It it's all comes out of inspiration from the Public History Collaborative. So digital stuff, I would love to someday make, you know, sort of a digital walking, historical walking tour of Tucson, mm. um, even over the campus of University of Arizona, that kind of stuff. Does that mean digital in terms of like how people are experiencing the history or how you're where you're finding your sources. Both, both, yeah. both, totally, yeah, okay. both, yeah. Cool. And, you know, digital history can also be about digitizing archives, um, which but the Public History Collaborative could do, but that is a very specific skill set that takes a ton of time, it takes a lot of labor, it takes a lot of technological access, you know, access to the to the tech. And so um, we're probably going to do less of that, at least initially. Then we're also really interested in experiential education. So offering opportunities for both of our, both our undergraduates in our classrooms to present their work in public, but also to get, you know, like K-12 teachers and classes and schools to come on campus to experience history it, literally in the making. Um, and then lastly, just a sponsor of a uh, collaborator, a partner, a support for really cool partners across Tucson doing interesting events. So we had a really fun event in early February um, called Sounds of History. We're going to hope that it's going to be like a kind of a three-part program. The first one was on jazz to honor Black History Month. The amazing Tawana Steptoe from um, the Department of History was one of the, the speakers, and as was Darius Carter from Gender and Women's Studies. And then we had high school jazz bands come and play and it was Sal Point and Catalina Foothills and Tucson High and it was so we had like 300 people come to this thing to listen to these young musicians who were amazing they were incredible and then and then we, we snuck in the history talks um, you know when people weren't looking <laughs> and they were they were I heard so much positive feedback from the folks in attendance just about how incredibly interesting history is because it is and so that's the other part of it is to try to think of ways to get local Tucsonans opportunities to interact and engage with, you know, quote unquote, scholarly history in, in ways that maybe they don't traditionally. Cool. So that's mostly for projects like in and around Tucson. Yeah. Okay. How might folks like get involved with that if they either wanted to come to your events or wanted maybe yeah. have their own little yeah. history project? Yeah. Or? PHC, uh, if you just go to, if you just Google P public history collaborative Arizona, it'll pop right up. It's, I think it's phc.arizona.edu. Um, and most of our stuff we'll, we'll put up there. We, so, but we, so that's probably the best place to see upcoming events, um, and to learn more about us. And then on there is a, as a place to sign up, um, just a Google form to get more information. Yeah. Cool. Yes. Speaking aspirationally in five years, what would you love to see PHC doing or involved well, in? Yeah, that's a great idea. Um, I, I, you know, it's, it's interesting because Funding is always a question, I think, anytime you're trying to do these endeavors. And we have successfully so far this year been able to do so many cool things with the support of our community partners. So Hotel Congress hosted the Sounds of History for free. David Slutes, who's the event director there, 
just believes in this kind of thing. And so um, lucky us. Tohono Chul uh, is hosting another event. It's in connection with the UNESCO Chair in Environmental History, which we have here at the University of Arizona. And we're going to do kind of a water and native plant celebration uh, at Tohono Chul. But that's, you know, that's hard to continue to do. And I think funding, I think having us financially secure um, in the near future would be a number one goal. Um, having said that, I don't think money should stop anything that we do. So uh, we'll just keep going. We, we I want to extend our partnerships with uh, local middle schools and high schools, maybe elementary schools, although that's that's pretty young. But that that and reaching out to teachers and, and offering some professional development and what have you to them would be really fun. Um, I really would love to do some sort of digital project and have something living online that the PhD has authored, like this we're walking to or, or, or something of the sort. And then we've got just tons of ideas for fun events. I wanted, We have a great historian in our department, Matthew Gilbert, who studies Hopi runners. Um, he's awesome. And so it'd be so fun to do a, a race, right? Tucson's a big race town. And so to have some sort of walk, run, roll event, even just here on campus and have him speak, just all kinds of fun things like that. Just continue that effort to bring history and connect it to present stuff that people enjoy, I think is really important. Music and and food. Um, we have several really fascinating scholars doing food history in our department. And so that that something around that will happen eventually. So we've got tons of ideas. And so what I hope in five years is that the Public History Collaborative is going gangbusters and doing all the things that, you know, we're right now, like you're saying, aspirationally dreaming about. Yeah. It seems so simple, but I think people forget. I myself, you know, don't always think of history as as what you're describing, food and music and the things that we do every day. Uh, but it's really heartening to see you yourself, your work, and, and other folks in the discipline who are getting away from kind of the history with a capital H. And it's, you know, great men doing things. Um, yes, exactly. <laughs> that's, that's really great to hear. Yeah. Um, with that more complex perspective, I know you're passionate about teaching. How do you then take this nuanced, multifaceted story of history and then teach that (laughs) (laughs) if it's not just dates and, you know, right. Well, right. There are very few dates in my class. You can almost, you can ask any of my students that I think that's such a good question. Um, It's not easy to do because students come in with preconceptions. Also, they come in thinking about capital H history and they come in thinking dates and memorization of laws and specific battles and wars and, you know, and all of that matters and is super, still super interesting. But I think one of the keys is to draw them to understand that politics is both formal and informal. So a lot of what I do is around the notion of power in my classroom and thinking about who has power, who doesn't have power. Does anybody ever not have power? Um, What does, what do power relationships look like in specific places? And, And so I'll usually take like a topic water right now. So I'm taking, I'm teaching environmental history this semester and I'm teaching water history. And so instead of this narrative, right, that starts at the beginning and ends at the end, we just sort of take anecdotes, um, almost case studies, if you will, and dissect those um, with a variety of questions that lead students to hopefully look at the complexity. So, so we, so I do teach a lot of formal politics because it matters. That often directs how communities live their lives and how individuals, uh, you know, experience experience the world and so it's never that we do only only fun music stuff we talk then about why why music matters and why it's powerful and so actually tomorrow we'll be thinking about um you know the the appearance of music in the blues in the 1930s and the ways in which that is kind of an interesting oral archive of black lived experience in the south especially with the flooding that happens um, we can do the same sort of thing, thinking about drought in the West. So just trying to get students to make all those fun connections, because then all of a sudden history isn't something that happened back then, but it's something that's happening now. And that's that, I think, um, draws them in um, and gets them excited about it. I have a question that I I feel like I have my own answer to and everybody probably does. So I don't want you to think I'm I'm asking it because, you know, I don't. But I would just love to hear your perspective on sort of. Why is that important? Why is is preserving this history and and interacting with it in this alive way important? What does that do for us as a society or as individuals? Yeah, that's a great question. I think um, it sounds almost cliche, but I do think that when you if you if you take a historical moment and you can look back on it and analyze it, it gives you the skill set to then come to the present and look at something similar and analyze it similarly. 
Um, and so I think it, it aids students in their understanding of the present. Oftentimes we talk about how it helps students learn who they are, right, in relationship to the world, and it helps them view the world in a multicultural way, which is, I think that's all true and super cool. But for me, it's about this skill set that allows them to go, okay, wait, I, I kind of, you know, I've learned about how to think about um, the Owens River, the Owens Valley, right, in the water uh, controversies that that have that existed in the Owens Valley, especially in the in the early 20th century, and continue to this day, and they kind of learn about how that power relationship happened, how that story unfolded from a variety of perspectives, and then they know that today, as they become citizens um, of whatever you know whatever nation state they're from, they they can sort of think about how do I think about current events in the same way and pay attention to all of the different unfoldings and all the different perspectives. And I think that's really empowering. I think the world is much scarier when you don't have memory. Um, And I think history is memory. And so, and it matters that we make sure that we recognize that it's lots of memories. um, And that just makes it even more rich, right? And so I think those two things, one, an, an analytical tool or toolkit for students, and then also for all of us to to have a memory. Um, and it doesn't have to be the same memory, but to recognize that we've come to be because of a series of, of interactions and relationships over time. And that, I think, makes the present richer, maybe less scary, maybe more scary, I don't know, for some, but certainly just um, more knowable in a way. Mm. Thank you for humoring that question. That's a <laughs> lovely answer. I wanted to circle back about something you mentioned way in the beginning, but queer ecologies. I know you were posted in gender and women's studies previously, and you said that informs your work, and I don't think queer ecologies, that thought tradition is super familiar to, to everyone. So how would you describe it, and what does it mean for you as a historian? Yeah, queer ecology comes out of queer studies, thinking about the, the role of nature in understanding sexualities was kind of where it started. So, for example, is heterosexuality, quote unquote, natural, right? Can we do we see homosexuality in in not more than human species? And of course, the answer is yes. And so it started out that way, but then it's been um, utilized and applied and I almost said co-opted, but that's such a negative term, uh, but utilized and, and shifted a little bit to think about just in general queering the ways in which we think about the environment, the ways in which we center humans, right? And thinking about uh, the ways that we can, in in new and interesting and funky ways, which is what queering really means, think about uh, biology, to think about ecology, to think about the more than human and the human interactions. And so it's just a, it's just a way to begin to, again, undo the dualisms, to rethink that binary of human and nature, and begin to, I think, to think more holistically and more creatively about the ways in which humans interact, not just with quote unquote non-humans, but with one another. Mm-hmm. I have a, a chapter coming up, I think it's gonna be, I think we're publishing in 2025, in the Oxford Handbook on on the history of animals, um, on ants. And so there might be out there a speculative piece eventually about that ant from the perspective of the ant historically acting over time. We'll see my summer project, but I'm really excited about it. I have um, an ant problem in my house. And so I'm particularly reminded of these little buggers on a fairly consistent basis. Sure. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Imagine there's not too much work about that. Yeah. Yeah. No, there's almost nothing, which is kind of, which makes it fun. And this, this uh, anthology is just going to be so cool. Um, I don't even, there's so many collaborators doing so many different kinds of animals. It's going to be really, it's going to be a really cool project. So that's fun. Sounds very cool. Love to ask any books or other media writers or anyone that you might recommend for folks interested in environmental history in the borderlands or just in general or any of the frameworks and topics you've mentioned. So right now I'm really reading a lot of traditional ecological knowledge, um, I think it has so much to lend, so much wisdom to lend to traditional Western thinking about the more than human. So, and I, I, probably everybody has read Robin Kimmerer's Braiding Sweetgrass. Um, I use it in all of my classes. I make it fit, even when it doesn't. <laughs> we read it, no matter what, because students love it. Yeah. And then there's really cool, like the Coyote, um, Coyote America, which is a book by Dan Flores about coyotes and, and kind of. It, it, I think the subtitle is A Natural and Supernatural History of the Coyote, and that's cool. 
I, we just read Invisible Reality in my graduate class by Rosalind LaPierre, and it's about the kind of the supernatural understandings of the Blackfeet peoples, uh, both in Canada and in the United, sort of the United States proper, Montana, pretty much. Let's see, what else am I reading right now? There's the, the oldies and the goodies. Nature's Metropolis is this huge, thick book by William Cronin. It's an older book. It was one of those that made me first think, oh my gosh, like everything is connected. And even the city itself, right? Nature's Metropolis. So it's about Chicago in the, in the 19th century and the rise of Chicago and the importance of quote unquote nature to the rise of that urban space. Uh, that's a really, really interesting book. I just read American Lucifers, and it's quite the book. And if you if you're interested in an art of history of artificial light, which sounds really weird, but it's amazing. You go from right from candles to tallow to coal to kerosene to camp. I mean, it's it is a it is a really incredible incredible work. I just I'm reading a book right now. It's called Soil, and it's by Camille Dungy, who's a professor at the at Colorado State University. And it's phenomenal. It's about her experience sort of building a garden in Fort, in Fort Collins, Colorado, as a, as a black mother. It's really cool. Um, so that's sort of the fun thing about my position that I wouldn't have seen coming. <laughs> I was originally hired back to the university in gender and women's studies, and I'm a comparative women's historian. That's what we called ourselves back in the day. Now it would be comparative gender historian. And I, so, that, so I ended up in gender and women's studies, and then would just do adjunct stuff for the history department. Um, and what it meant for me in gender women's studies was I was surrounded by all these ethnographers and all these American studies folks and all even these English folks, right? Like these lit crit folks, literary criticism, um, which was sort of outside my disciplinary training. But I, they've made they've really influenced me in the last six or seven years to think way beyond any of the academic silos that that we traditionally have. So I have to be honest and say that I've mostly been reading you know, in non-history stuff, because I, that that's a, a literature um, and a world that I didn't have to do in graduate school. And then when you're teaching high school students, you're busy trying to figure out how to make them memorize the presidents um, for AP, <laughs> just for AP, I swear, not my normal classes. <laughs> yeah, so it's so that's kind of so that's what's in my mind is not necessarily even environmental history per se, but certainly all of those other kinds of disciplines that are lending so much ways, ways of thinking and ways of knowing about the more than human and about about humans and our interactions over time. I always think of history as kind of this through line between all of the disciplines that it surfaces in, in every single one of them. So it's it's really cool that you're able to do that. Yeah, and that's that's why I think, I don't think people understand what history is, mm. um, what, the, what the study of history really is. Mm-hmm. I think, you know, kind of the History Channel maybe messed us up a little bit on that and, you know, whatever. Um, maybe even AP US History for a while. But I think history is just one of the coolest disciplines, um, and especially if you're just understanding it as this really creative way to look at the past. Mm-hmm. I have one more question for you that I thought of when you were describing your reading list. Uh, you mentioned you're reading a lot of traditional ecological knowledge, and we've talked some today about how history is being presented in different ways and thought of in different ways within the broader discipline. Do you think that there are changes in the discipline happening right now that are also allowing for more like indigenizing of history or like methodologies to capturing history and and in what ways are changes happening in the discipline broadly? Oh yeah, I think so for sure. I don't, I do think that history can still tend to be sort of geographically divided in weird ways, right? So even in our department still, we have our quote unquote caucuses, which is US and Latin America and Europe. And so it's still very kind of geographically based, which makes, there's some, there's some good reason for that. Um, But I think increasingly we're starting to think about thematic approaches to in the discipline. Um, So instead of you're going to be a U.S. historian of the 20th century, very temporal and very place based, we're starting to think more about thematically. Right. So you might be a food historian that might be comparative of, you know, North American foodways with, you know, South American foodways and and the African diaspora's foodways and kind of comparing all of those at a particular moment in time or over time. So I think that's one of the areas that uh, the discipline itself is really becoming incredibly uh, rich and and I think uh, kind of creative in the way that we're approaching it. It's hard because then you don't have your your set archive, right? You don't have, it's, it's, it's harder to do that kind of history, but I think it's, it's, it's really exciting. I think oral histories, I think recognizing the importance of people telling their own stories, because I think critical archive studies, although it's not maybe as attached to the formal discipline or field of history, 
I think critical archive studies, which is kind of more of a library information science kind of, of uh, field, is having a lot of effect on our on, on the historical discipline in that we're we we are doing well to think about how archives aren't perfect and that depending on the period of time that you're looking at, only certain people's stories got to, got kept in those archives. And so when you go into the archive, you're getting a very narrow, narrow uh, look at, at what was happening. And so one, you've got to be really creative and go beyond the archive, thinking about finding newspapers and, and all of that kind of stuff that may not be actually in a collection, a manuscript collection in an archive. But then as we're doing more recent history, mid 20th century on, I think in oral histories are starting to become much more sought after. I think we're becoming more aware that we need to collect them um, as a field. Um, and so, yeah, I do. I think methods are changing. And I think that the field itself is, uh, yeah, coming into the 21st century in really fun ways, <laughs> which is kind of funny because it's historical. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. Yes. Yes. Well, thank you so much. Yes. Thank Appreciate you. Your time. That was very fun. Yeah.